specialist of uh, computing the cost of uh, air pollution. So, one minute to download the presentation. And Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank, thank you very much, Francois, for the introduction. So I'm going to talk today and tomorrow, and today I'm going to focus on the health, uh, on the computation of the economic impact of uh, the health part of uh, the climate change or, or uh, any, any study uh, accounting for, for change in health of the population. So what I'm going to do today is to start with uh, uh, an explanation of the focus of the talk of today, then having a quick overview of the three uh, main economic approaches that can be used to uh, assess health impacts, then uh, focusing on mortality issues because it's the main, uh, the largest burden of the health effects. Uh, so I'm going to spend more time uh, on these mortality issues and then uh, on the morbidity issues and finally uh, presenting a, a, a new, uh, in the sense that it has about 25 years old, uh, way to quantify uh, both the mortality and the morbidity issues, the daily. So the focus today is going to be on health, that is the central part here of the presentation. Because uh, when uh, there is a change in the environment, there in the air pollution, there are uh, both change regarding our health, but also regarding ecosystems and our environment. So uh, there are going to be uh, things I will present tomorrow on the left part and the right part of the, the slide, but today we are going to focus on this central part, that is the direct health effects related to air pollution exposure. And these direct health effects are composed by direct costs, that is the costs that are directly linked to, uh, the, air exposition, to the air pollution exposure, uh, hospitalization, medical consultation, medical treatment, and the valorization of a premature death, and then also indirect costs uh, the loss of production due to the fact that you can't work when you are ill, uh, psychological impacts, uh, physical sufferings, discomfort, and so on. And what we have in green uh, are things that, uh, for which prices can be observed on markets, uh, or tariffs, or, or prices. And in yellow, it's more what, as an economist, uh, I qualify as value, uh, that is, there are no market for that, but anyway, there is a value for an economist uh, to, to quantify these things. So today we are going to focus on the central part, and in particular, the gray area here, which is uh, the, the component uh, for which economists agree uh, that they should enter any uh, economic uh, assessment of uh, air pollution exposure. For the other part, it depends on the scope of the analysis, whether or not we have to account for psychological impacts, for physical suffering, for induced impact of friends and family due to the fact that I am ill or I am at hospital and they have to spend time to visit me, uh, or my parents, if I am a kid, uh, have to, to stop working to visit uh, their child, uh, their children uh, at hospital. So the non-gray area are more uh, less consensual among economists. So second point in this introduction is the what are we exactly uh, looking for? If it is the global burden of air pollution, so it's really easy to do that. We have a steady state with air pollution. We have a steady state without air pollution and we compute the difference of these two steady states and we get what is the global burden associated to air pollution exposure. That is the difference between here, this level, and this level. So uh, uh, this difference here represents the, the, represents the global burden of air pollution. 
But as an economist, we may be interested in uh, either computing what would be the future economic burden of today's air pollution, or what is today's impact of yesterday's air pollution. And here things are a little bit more complex because we have both short-term effects and long-term effects. For short-term effects, uh, due to the, the way they are, they are assessed by epidemiology, they are supposed to occur within few, a few days after uh, uh, an air pollution exposure. And so these uh, short-term effects are going to disappear immediately here. The scale is not correct, it's just an illustration. If we uh, suppress uh, air pollution in 2000, we will immediately get the uh, health effects uh, represent, associated with uh, short-term exposure. But for the long-term effects, we will need some time before being able to observe the wool benefits of this reduction because this uh, impact, chronic mortality and chronic morbidity, requires some time because of the, the way the, the, the body uh, works to be effective. So there is a delay here, going from this point to this point, that is all the long-term effects are going to disappear, not immediately, like the short term, but by requiring some, some delay here. First reason, due to the, the way the, the body uh, recover, and second reason, because the policy to be implemented to move from one level of exposure to a very lower, uh, lower level are going to require some time, and this time is going to affect the computation of the long-term health effects. So for these two different approaches, there are some drawbacks and some uh, advantages of them. The steady test approach, the idea is that quickly you get an, a, a broad idea of the magnitude of the public health issue. It's easy to compute, it's easy to understand, it's informative and pedagogical. It's correct, as we have seen, for the short-term effects, but for long-term health effects, it may be misleading, especially if you conduce a cost-benefit analysis, because the cost of the policy that is going to be implemented to reduce air pollution are going to be observed right now, but the benefits are going to be fully observed in uh, 20, 30 years. So this may be misleading for the long-term effects. For the marginal approach, it's more useful for policy decision maker, for decision makers or in a cost-benefit analysis perspective. They are correct for both short-term and long-term effects. They uh, assess when and how long-term effects occur. You have to, to however, to, 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 to put some assumptions on the way you, you are moving to one level to the other one. You can account in the process for the change in the population distribution because you are following cohorts during several years, so uh, the other uh, cause of deaths uh, uh, are taken into account, but it's more complex to implement and it requires some, as I said, additional assumption on the epidemiologic part uh, to explain how to move from one level to, to the other one. So under standard assumption, long-term health effects that are computed with the first approach, the steady state approach, can enter a cost-benefit analysis, but the long-term effect should be divided by a factor by uh, between 1.6 and 2.5, depending on the assumption uh, made, to enter directly the, the cost-benefit analysis. And finally, just to point on uncertainty, I, I've seen that uh, you had a lecture on uncertainty uh, yesterday, I think, or this morning maybe. Uh, and so just a, re reminding here, a reminder here, uh, the economic discipline uh, is going to, to enter the process at the end after all the other disciplines. So that in addition to its own uh, uncertainties, the, uh, the economic part is going to add all the certainties from the uh, measure of the concentration for the uh, count of the number of cases associated to air pollution exposure, so that uh, we have to pay a specific attention to uh, a certainty, and there are two broad ways. One is to do it uh, separately uh, on the economic values chosen and on the epidemiologic outcomes, and the best way to do, but it, it requires more, more work, is to, to perform an overall analysis that is going to cover both the epidemiologic data and the economic value, uh, Monte Carlo simulation type approach, where you, you assume some distribution for the uh, epidemiologic part from the economic distribution of cost, and, and, and you, you draw several times to have the whole distribution. So then, regarding the, the three main approaches we, we have in economics, the first one is 
and the best one, if you, we can do this, is to get directly the prices or the tariffs on the market. We directly observe uh, the, the, the price here. This is, for morbidity, the cost of illness. Uh, it is uh, especially suitable for the assessment of medical treatment costs that include uh, hospitalization and production loss. You can observe uh, wages on, on, the, ma on the, the market, the job market. Hospitalization cost, uh, thanks to the health ministry. So it's easy to implement, but you cannot account for uh, intangible costs uh, like uh, pain, grief, suffering, and so on. The market prices and tariffs are fixed by the uh, government or the health agencies, so it's not really a, a, a market that is in pure and perfect uh, competition, and it does not rely on individual preferences, but, however, it is widely used in uh, the health impact assessment uh, when you have to do an economic uh, evaluation. For mortality, I in the past, uh, a method may be used uh, known as uh, human capital approach or loss of production method, and this approach considered that uh, the value of the life of someone uh, was equal to all the future production losses measured by the discounted present value of earnings over the remaining life expectancy. The idea that if you die at 40 instead of 80, uh, you uh, lose 40 years of earnings and you discount all these uh, years of earning uh, and this uh, remaining discounted uh, value of these uh, production losses is what an individual uh, is worth. So it's widely uh, discussed in the literature and this met method is almost no longer used. So I'm not going to, to spend time to, to present it, but uh, 50 years ago, it was one of the way uh, we may put a value on a mortality. So just uh, a precision here, uh, it may be uh, weird or, or shocking to put a value on, on, a, de on, on a death, but uh, if we want to take into account all the components uh, of air pollution exposure, mortality is one of the components. And, if we do not put a value on mortality, it is like if it uh, were equal to zero. So we have to make mortality enter the, the analysis and we have to put a value, not a price, but put a value on, on, on a death. The two other approaches that can be used are the indirect approach and the direct uh, approach. The indirect approach uh, known as revealed preferences. In, this approach involves situations in which people actually face trade-off between money and physical risk of death or physical risk of illness. And what this, the observation of this market reveal are willingnesses to pay. That is, if you prefer uh, to live in, uh, in a place without pollution rather than in a place with pollution, the premium associated to the fact that you live in a place without pollution correspond to how much you evaluate the fact that you decrease morbidity and mortality risk by living in a less polluted place. And so by uh, statistical approaches, you can in infer what is the value associated with living in a less polluted place. You can do the same thing with, uh, on the job market with uh, risky and less risky jobs. Uh, more risky jobs uh, are uh, better paid than a less risky jobs, so that the premium uh, associated with more risky jobs can help us construct a value for prevented fatality, a value of life, by uh, knowing at the same time how much uh, the risky job is more risky, by five per 10,000 and so on. So you can compute statistically uh, what is the value of uh, death based on observing markets, labor markets, housing market, or averaging goods with the same reasoning. So this type of approach deal with actual choices observed, so it's nice because the housing market, the labor market, or the averaging good markets uh, do exist, but it's sometimes difficult to isolate a particular risk reduction when there are several types of risks that are reduced at the same time, both mortality and morbidity reduced when you, 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 you live in a less polluted place so that it may be difficult to disentangle both. 
it postulates that people are perfectly aware of the type of risk they, they have when they choose a job or when they choose to live in one specific place, which is not necessarily true. And uh, the population that choose uh, risky jobs is not uh, representative of the whole population, of the general population, that people that are less risk averse that choose more risky jobs. So we cannot generalize easily uh, what we observe on the job market to the general population. But this type of methods of method are uh, sometimes used to value mortality and morbidity. And finally, the, the most used approach uh, is uh, referred to as stated preference approach. It's a direct approach. You uh, implement surveys in which you ask people how much they are willing to pay for improved safety or for a decrease in the probability of having an illness, and then you directly get uh, through these surveys, the value uh, people associate to uh, dimini uh, diminution of risk or di of risk of death or, or risk of illness. So it's easy to implement. Uh, you do not need a, a heavy uh, theoretical framework compared to revealed preferences in which you assume that people are perfectly aware of the risk. In, in here, you present in your hypothetical scenario the risk, so you perfectly explain what is the trade-off you offer to people uh, when they uh, give you the answer, I'm willing to pay 10 euros to decrease my uh, probability of death by one per 10,000. Uh, you, you give them the whole information. So it allows a very precise description of the trade-off and the risk at stake because you construct the scenario. But uh, there are several um, drawbacks among which it is a survey, so you do not observe real behavior. People can say, I will do that uh, if you offer me the, the choice, but in reality, if they do have to do the, this choice, they may not uh, do what they have said they would do in this such a situation. So it's hypothetical. There are some biases due to the wording, the, the, due to the elicitation biases, the way you, you elicit the, the monetary values. There may be some strategic bias in the fact that as a, an individual surveyed, you say, I'm going to answer that because by answering that, the public decision maker is going to do that, so it's good for me, but in reality, I will not do that. So there may be some strategic bias involved in these surveys, but more or less, uh, this type of approach are more and more used uh, as we are going to see for mortality. And, and uh, even if they have some drawbacks, for instance, uh, for children, very young children, you cannot uh, survey them. So you have to survey the general population, their parents, uh, the children. So there are some issues uh, anyway, but these methods are very used. I will skip that. So uh, let's focus now on mortality effects, which represents generally between 80 and 90% of the overall health burden associated to air pollution exposure. So it's uh, the major part, and I will spend a little bit more time on these aspects. So first, how to express the mortality effects of air pollution exposure. So the intuition is that uh, it's not a, a scoop I'm going to tell you. Everybody is going to die. The problem is when, uh, is it going to be very much before the expected uh, date of death due to the air pollution exposure? Is it going to be a few months, a few days before the expected death because my, my uh, state of health were, was already uh, bad? So uh, what we can see here is that when we apply to a cohort uh, of people uh, among uh, above 30 years old, uh, probability, an additional probability of death due to air pollution exposure, between 30 and 80 years, you observe less death here. But then all the people that survived that were not killed when you, you make your cohort run uh, until extinction, uh, when everybody uh, uh, is uh, above 120 years, then you will have all this death that occurs later than expected. So this area and this area correspond. And you see that there is just a move of the date of death of the whole population exposed. So uh, we have to take this in, into account when you, you, you try to put a value on, uh, on mortality. And there are four main ways 
uh, to express a change in mortality risk, and they can be based on the same relative risk of death associated to a given level of air pollution exposure. The first one is to count the number of premature deaths, and you implicitly assume that there is an average of Y years of life lost per premature death. In general, it's about uh, 10 years for chronic uh, mortality, uh, 28 years uh, I've seen in the, one of the presentation uh, yesterday or, or the first day. It depends really of, of the assumption made, but the order of magnitude is uh, like that for chronic mortality. Uh, and for uh, acute uh, mortality, for short-term effects, it's around one year or several months. It depends of the level of exposure uh, here again. The second way to, to express a change in mortality uh, risk is to uh, compute the average change in life expectancy. That is, you, you, you compute this to the whole population of interest and you assume that every individual in this population is going to lose X month uh, of, uh, of life. And generally, it's, as I said, less than one, one year, between one and, and 10 months, uh, depending on the study. Then you can also count the overall number of years of life lost. That is, it is either X times the size of the population or Y times the number of premature deaths. It depends on whether you compute it as a number of victims of the population or a general loss in the whole population of uh, life expectancy. And finally, you can also, if you have uh, more detailed uh, data from the epidemiology, uh, epidemiologic part, compute a number of years of life, of life lost by age. That is, you use dynamic life tables that compares for each age the number of years of life uh, lost saved. So for uh, the first uh, uh, way to compute here, A, you will need a value for prevented fatality. And for the three other ones, you will need a value of a life year, because here you, are, you have a year of life lost, and here you have number of premature deaths. So regarding the way to derive uh, a volley, I think I'm going to skip that. You have it in, in the PDF. Just uh, keep in mind that the fact that you can express the value of a prevented fatality as a flow of value of life year, uh, discounted value of life year, is controversial among economists. So some, prefer, some economists prefer to ask directly uh, people what is your uh, estimation of a value of a life year, instead of deriving it from the value of a prevented fatality. So you can find both in the literature, but, but uh, getting a value of a prevented fatality is uh, something which, which it is shared by the community of economists. Deriving, it, deriving the vol uh, volley from a VPF or vice versa, uh, going from VPF as, uh, computing the VPF as a, the summation of uh, volley is, is, less, is more controversial. So, second, what do empirical economic evaluations of mortality effects tell us? If you look at the literature, and here, uh, this is a, a, an histogram uh, that is derived from uh, a study done by Lindjem, Biosk, and, uh, and um, Bratton from OECD here in 2010, but published in 2012, and I will present the, briefly the result after. It involves uh, eight 154 observations from 75 different surveys. You see here the distribution of the value of prevented fatality. Uh, you, are, you have here on the y-axis the number of study, and here on the x-axis the, the value in US dollar. Uh, and you see that most of the valuation of prevented fatality are between, let's say, 1 and 7 million uh, euros. Here. Most of the, the values are in this range here. And if you look at the literature uh, regarding the, val the computation of the value of prevented fatality and the su these surveys, what you observe is that there are two uh, things that uh, matter uh, when you, you put a value of, uh, on a prevented fatality. The attributes of the victims and the attributes of the risk of death. Regarding the victims, you can imagine that depending on the age at death, and hence the remaining life expectancy at death, depending on the degree of premature death and depending on the life quality of at death, you will have a propension to pay to, to, 
to suppress this premature death, that uh, is going to, to change. It's not the same to die at 60 <coughs> instead of 61, losing one year. It's not the same thing that if you die at uh, 15 instead of 80. So you see that both the age at death and the degree of premature, prematurity uh, are going to, to matter. So here is another, yeah, we can see what is observed in the literature, more or less. Uh, this is an inverted U shape that is observed both theoretically and empirically, with the maximum around uh, 50 years old and lower values for at 20 and uh, at older ages. Here you have the same thing, uh, this inverted U shape here. You have here the value of a permitted fatality, and here the age, and on a survey done with, with a colleague, Stéphane Lucini, we observe uh, this, uh, this inverted U shape in our sample of uh, more than 1,000 uh, uh, individuals. So the conclusion here is that it may be appropriate to adjust the value of a permitted fatality to reflect the fact that willingness to pay values of people at different ages or to use volley. If you use volley, then you will uh, account for these differences in age because uh, you will apply a volley that is a value of a life year times the number of years lost. So you implicitly take into account the age effect by using volley. This is not the case when you use a value of a prevented fatality because you have to, to use one value for everybody or to distinguish by using different values at different ages. The second uh, point, the second lesson we get from these studies is that the uh, attributes of the risk of death uh, matter. Uh, in particular, Fischoff has shown that the following attributes are going to decrease your tolerance to risk and then increase your willingness to pay for a risk decrease, then increase the value of prevented fatality. That means that if you are facing a risk that is involuntary, personally uncontrollable, not you don't feel responsible for this risk, it's an unfam unfamiliar risk, dreadful, uncertain, catastrophic, unfair, immediate, memorable, trustworthy, and not related to direct personal benefit, then you have a lower tolerance to this risk, then you are willing to pay more, even if the change proposed in the level of uh, mortality risk is the same. The characteristic of these risks make you willing to pay more to decrease it, and then it's going mathematically to increase the value of the prevented fatality. If you want to pay more to uh, suppress the, the given risk, uh, uh, or to diminish uh, your exposure to a risk by a given amount, then it's going to increase the value of the prevented fatality. So the conclusion we can get here, following uh, James Amit, is that accurate valuation of uh, prevented fatality requires the use of a scenario-specific values. That is, you have to use a scenario that is specific to air pollution when you ask people how much are you willing to pay to reduce your risk of death. You say that, but you say, if this death is caused, due, is due to an air pollution exposure, then you get a contextual value for your VPF, your value of prevented fatality. So we can see that, just focus on the gray uh, bar here. This is an Australian study uh, that compared different uh, value of prevented fatality or value of statistical life here on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have different, uh, uh, different sectors, health, occupational safety, transport, environment, other. Here, it's the average of the Australian studies and the international studies. And you can see that for health, for instance, the different uh, studies that compute uh, VPF for us uh, get lower uh, VPF than for occupational safety here, for instance, or less than uh, transport, that environment uh, gets the highest uh, average uh, VPF and all the risks are in the middle between these two. So the, this is an illustration on the fact that the context in which you get this diminution of risk matter when you express your willingness to pay to reduce this risk. So how to uh, express uh, mortality effects in monetary terms? So th there are a lot of studies in various fields, transportation, w at work, uh, in, in, in regarding medication, but specific to the air pollution context, there are very few studies. So we can have four strategies to account for differences in the risk and differences in the victim attributes. 
I will uh, briefly present them. Two are ex post correction method, two are ex ante correction method. So briefly, the first way to proceed is to apply an overall correction factor to account for these differences of age and quality of life at death, to account for the fact that you are dealing with an air pollution exposure. So you start from a general value. Here, I give a few examples. For France, for instance, uh, in 2001, the, the way to take into account uh, death due to air pollution exposure was to start from a general value of 1.5 million euro for an accidental death in public transportation, used by the, the French government to value future, future infrastructure projects. Then it was applied a 0.67 factor because it was uh, corresponding to a death in private transportation, so you get 1 million, and then you multiply by 0 0.53 to account for differences in quality and quantity of life of years lost, considering that when you die in, in a road accident, the, the median age of death is 39 years. When you die due to earth pollution exposure, the median age of death is about 70, 75 years old. And so to account for these differences, the French government proposed to uh, apply this 0 0.53 correction, and then you, you count death due to air pollution exposure with the amount 0 0.53 million euros per death instead of 1.5 million euros if this death was due to a public uh, transportation accident by in a train or, or in a subway. Other countries did the same thing. The factor was six, 0 0.61 here in, in, uh, in, uh, in, for Europe in the first project. It was uh, 0 0.7 in UK, 0 0.6 in for several European countries. So it is the first way to account for these differences in uh, attribute of risk and attribute of death. The second way is to use quality adjusted life year to account for the health state at the age of death. So the quality, quality is equal to one year of life times the health-related quality of life for this year, that is, in economic terms, the utility associated to this year. And the, the, the scale is one for perfect health and zero for death, even if there are states that are worse than death and, and can be negative, but uh, there is a, a choice that is done that zero is the, the, the bottom value. And so what you, you count here on, on the x-axis, it's time. On the y-axis, it's the quality uh, of the life years uh, lived, and then, Without pollution, you have this. With pollution, you have uh, this. Oh, it's the reverse. I think it's the reverse. Uh, and no, it's that, it's that. Without pollution, you, you live longer and in better health here. With, with pollution, you start to imagine that you have a chronic uh, illness here that de decrease your, uh, your quality of health, and then uh, you die earlier. And the difference between this two surfaces is going to give you the number of quality, the number of quality adjusted life year, and then you apply a value to this quality, a volley, the value of a life year lost, times the quality, and you get a valuation of uh, the death due to uh, moving from the state without pollution to the state with pollution. And uh, there are several uh, issues, but I think I'm going to skip them. You, you have them on the on the slides. Uh, just keep in mind the last one. It is considered that you have a double penalty for people with poor health. They are ill, so they are in bad health, but in addition, their year of life of life lost have less value than those in perfect health, and then when you decide which is the best uh, public health uh, uh, policy, their year of life lost are going to be less taken into account in the analysis because they are in, in bad health, and it's uh, quite unfair. I consider it's quite unfair. And there are two other ways to account for uh, the fact that death due to air pollution differ from uh, other type of death. One way is to mimic air pollution context. That is, you propose in, in your scenario, in your stated preference scenario, you propose a type of risk which is very close to the one we observed uh, uh, in the context of air pollution, that is similar disease, mainly respiratory, cardiovascular, and lung cancer. The similar magnitude of in annual risk mortality changes here. Uh, 
uh, one in 10,000 or five in 10,000 per year, and similar age class of the victims between 40 and 75 years old. So you do not say that in your scenario you are dealing with air pollution, but the type of risk you present and for which you ask uh, people to do a trade-off between money and the diminution of this risk is the same than the one we observed in air pollution context. And finally, the last way to proceed is to ask directly people in the stated preference scenario how much they are willing to pay to reduce their exposure to air pollution. Here, the context is directly air pollution. And you, you can see here an overview of the values we can obtain in developed countries and, and, and other countries. And these are the few studies I found, and I think there are not a lot much, uh, that have implemented a stated preference, asking people uh, how much they are willing to pay to reduce the risk of mortality due to air pollution. So to sum up, uh, when you have to, to value uh, economically uh, mortality due to air pollution exposure, the best choice would be to use a country-specific contextual value of prevented fatality overly. It depends on the metrics you use to measure mortality, uh, number of deaths or, or number of years of life lost. And a reasonable choice is to use a meta-analytic value proposed by the OECD. I, I showed you the, the, the histogram. Uh, and uh, used to, value, to assess the health effects of air pollution by the World Bank and by uh, WHO and OECD in 2015. This, they proposed to use a 3 million euro uh, value, or 3 million dollars, it depends on the, the rate of change at this time, uh, for OECD countries, and to adjust for differences in average income in gross domestic product, in purchasing power parity between countries. It depends. But to, to take into account the fact that the average uh, uh, level of life in developed countries is not the same than uh, in developing countries, and to adjust for this, starting from this 3 million uh, euros value. As a, as volley, the range, a reasonable range would be between 40,000 and 120,000 uh, euros per year lost due to air pollution exposure. And uh, regarding the use of qualities, uh, it's not currently very widespread in environmental health impact assessments, so uh, I would not recommend to, uh, uh, today to, to do that. Then moving to morbidity issues, it's going to be a little bit faster. The first way to proceed for acute health effects is to observe uh, in the literature what are the value either corresponding to cost of illness, that is the prices and tariffs observed, observed or uh, on willingness to pay study that have been conduced in which you ask people how much would you be willing to pay to avoid being asthmatic over your whole life and people uh, try to, 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 to explain, uh, to, to get a value, to give a value and, and that would be uh, the value used to avoid uh, being asthmatic. And so here, there are two examples I provide here. You have here the values used. For instance, uh, the value to avoid the chronic bronchitis for adults is 169,000 euros. The value to avoid, uh, uh, let's say, a lower res respiratory symptom in adults is 8 euros here or uh, a respiratory hospital admission due to air pollution is valued as 4,300 uh, euros. So it's cost you can get from the general health uh, system uh, and you apply them. There are other, another type of values used here based on the Clean Air for Europe methodology. Uh, and you can see that for, for instance, for uh, let's say cardiac hospital admission, it's 2,000 euros per, per case. And then you count how many uh, acute cases of morbidity you have, and you multiply this number by the value uh, in euros or dollars or whatever currency. But you have to pay attention to two things. First, uh, the fact that, for instance, the health system differs, so that the, the average length of stay may differ depending on the countries. Here we can see that for a similar disease, similar event, uh, acute myocardial infarction, in Finland you spend 11.5 days in hospital and in Turkey or Norway or Sweden it's less than five days. So when you compute 
uh, the average value that correspond to an acute myocardial infarction due to air pollution exposure, depending on the country uh, in which you, you, you assess this value, you have to consider both the duration of hospitalization that differ, but also the difference in the average cost per day at hospital. Then when you have to uh, account for chronic health effects, uh, you can use uh, value based on cost of illness, and you have uh, four different ways to, to do that. The first one is to compute directly the standard cost of illness, that is the average remaining life duration in years, times the average number of episodes, times per, per year, times the average cost per episode. So you get the two first data from the epidemiology part of the, uh, the work, and the last uh, part, the average cost per episode, is provided by the economist. And then, for instance, you estimate asthma as uh, uh, being worth uh, 4,900 uh, dollars uh, per year, computed as uh, shown uh, here with the, the standard COI. Then you can also proceed by computing for the population of people having a specific disease and the population of people not having this disease, what is the difference in the hospital and primary uh, care cost per person and per year for uh, a given type of uh, illness. Here for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, for instance, when you compare the, the hospital and primary care cost for the population having COPD and not having COPD, you compute this difference, and on average, you have a value of $4,400, uh, for instance. You can be a little bit uh, precise in doing that uh, by matching people with the same characteristics, because uh, people with COPD may be older than the other ones. So to, to be more precise, you may match people with the same age and same gender, same. Uh, characteristics and to compute the difference of course and the, the last way is to use Markov model in which you have probability to move from one state of severity to the other one and cost associated with that. So this was, this was for morbidity uh, cost due to chronic uh, morbidity and uh, using the cost of illness method. You can do things similar with willingness to pay and here you have in the literature several studies that provide you uh, the value uh, people are willing to pay to avoid uh, being asthmatic, having a chronic bronchitis, and so on. One of the issues is uh, the following. Can the willingness to pay to avoid an outcome caused by air pollution exposure and the willingness to pay to avoid an outcome caused by another factor or a non-specified factor be considered as the same? That is, if you know that your asthma is due to the fact that you have been exposed to air pollution when you were youth, would this change your variation of the fact that you are asthmatic uh, compared to the case where, uh, in which you do not know what is the cause of asthma or uh, it's not specified in, in, the, in the study? So to sum up uh, what we can do with morbidity evaluation, uh, the suggestion is to use the cost of illness as a partial assessment and the willingness to pay for the actual overall social cost that account for intangible cost Intangible costs are accounted for because when you are asked how much are you willing to pay to avoid being asthmatic, you also consider all the pain, sufferings, and, and discomfort due to the fact that you are asthmatic, in addition to the potential reduction in your life expectancy if your asthma is, is severe. Here again, it is recommended to use country-specific data for both health outcomes and economic unit value, and to account for loss of production based on country-specific average wage per day. You have a job market that works, and you take the average uh, daily or monthly uh, or weekly uh, wage, and you apply it to the length of uh, time you spend uh, not being able to, to work. Finally, uh, a few la uh, four last si slides. Uh, I briefly present here something which, is, which has been proposed by the World Bank in 1993, uh, the um, disability adjusted life years that account for both mortality and morbidity with the same metric. So it's not widely uh, done except by World Bank and, and uh, WHO uh, now. It has advantages and also drawbacks, but the idea is that this disability-adjusted life year daily 
are the sum of the year of life lost and the year of life lost due to disability. That is YLL and YLD. With YLL being uh, computed as the number of death times the number of years of life lost. And the YLD being the number of cases times the severity of the uh, morbidity episode, or, uh, morbidity uh, illness, times the duration. But pay attention to two things. First, uh, that severity is measure, measured here with perfect health equal to zero and death equal to one. It, it is a reverse way from the, the quality, so pay attention to that. And here, it is one of the advantages of this method. We provide regularly, the last time was in 2015, a list of disease and symptoms with associated severity. So you have one scale proposed. Currently, there are about 250 disease and symptoms that are uh, given a, a severity mark, and you apply the severity mark when you, you compute your, your, uh, your YLD. This is an advantage with respect to quality, for which you have several ways to, to do this. Uh, you will have a look to the difference with quality. I just show you here how it works. How it works. You start. You have here the age of, of someone. Here you have uh, in white the potential earthly life years, and in grey the years else loss. Here you have loss due to the fact you have a leukemia here, you have a pneumonia, very short duration, uh, very strong severity uh, at this age. And then you have a progressive uh, cardiopulmonary disease that decreases the, the, your ability up to death. And here you have all these parts that correspond, of the gray part here up to that, that correspond to the uh, year of loss uh, disability, and here, because you die before, you lose all the, uh, this duration with the full disability, so here you have the year of life, life lost. So YLL plus YLD is equal to the daily. It is how, how it is used, and this is the uh, two last slides. For instance, for um, the air pollution exposure, you have here mortality associated, that is the number of cases, times the severity, which is one, times the duration, the number of life year lost uh, in this study, 10.9, that is the number of deaths times one times 10.9 year of life lost is equal to 169 dailies. You have the similar computation for morbidity, for a chronic respiratory symptom for a child, you have the number of uh, this uh, outcome, the severity given by the WU, 0 0.7, the duration one year, and you get the number of daily. This is for chronic here effects, this is for uh, acute effects, and you see that the order of magnitude between chronic and acute is very different. Uh, here you have about 200,000 here, a few thousand. And between mortality and morbidity here, mortality, morbidity, chronic, and mortality and morbidity here are also different. So finally, to conclude, but it is, I sum up what I have said before, so I think it's not necessary to, to, to come again on, on this, except the, the last part here. Just an advice, generally, the health system uh, collects data on mortality very accurately. You get, uh, in developed countries, and I think it's the same in, in other countries, you get uh, a register of death which is very precise and you can apply your relative risk to, uh, to the, the population or count the number of uh, uh, deaths associated with air pollution very accurately. But for morbidity, you generally have to enter the Health system and collect by yourself or find a way to collect data and mobility, which is a lot of, of work. And so what is sometimes done, and for instance in OECD 2014, is to compute the mortality cost of air pollution and then to apply a 10% uh, uh, addition to account for the mobility effect. And you have an overall estimation of the whole health effect due to air pollution exposure the one which is currently and accurately computed based on mortality data, and then 
10% of this, which is added to, to account for the morbidity effect. And finally, as I said, and I, be, uh, I began with that, uh, if you use the cost-benefit analysis, pay attention to the delay issue for the long-term effects. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions? Yep. Thanks. Um, I had a question on willingness to pay. Mm -hmm. Does that account for your salary? Or, I mean, how do you, uh, people might be willing to pay all sorts of money if they had it, but. Yes. Uh, it's uh, an issue. Uh, in fact, what is done generally is first to remind people that they have a budget constraint and they are asked how much uh, the household earn a year, uh, each year and they are uh, reminded, uh, don't forget that the amount you are willing to pay is going to be removed from your, your, your uh, household wage and your household uh, income and you will not be able to buy other things than. But as I said, it's a drawback of, of the method. And, the methodology and the main one that is it is declared uh, value so uh, nothing can uh, avoid that people uh, give a very high amount that they would not give uh, actually if they were facing this and uh, what is done in addition to this is to remove the too high uh, willingness to pay that correspond to a too large share of the household income Generally, if people declare they are willing to pay more than 20 or 25 percent of the household income, they are removed from the analysis. We, we, we trimmed the, the data. And uh, the last way to try to avoid this is in the way we construct a scenario. Uh, the trade-off is going to be made uh, so that, uh, and the, the way the elicitation uh, is proposed is. Uh, constructed uh, in a way that people uh, are very aware that uh, they do uh, choose between different amounts to pay every day and this is an additional one that is proposed and uh, they have to pay attention to the fact that it's going to be uh, against other expenses. Just, I don't know if it's a question or a consideration, I mean, I, I expected that from the economical part there were more certainties than uncertainties. While well, you show us that on the costs related to air pollution, but I mean the health impact assessment, we are still far to have uh, a, a well accepted methodology to define the cost of death, the cost of morbidity, direct and indirect. So how can we use, I mean, uh, which is the perspective uh, in how long we will have uh, a database shared by, I mean, and not just in Europe, but all over the world, I mean, to, 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 to calculate the impact of air pollution all over the world. Yes, maybe I've been a little bit pessimistic or too exhaustive in presenting things. What we can say is that for morbidity, the cost of illness method is widely used, everybody agree. Then we can add some components to, to take into account intangible effects. It's up to the, the, the guy who do the analysis to add them or not. But at minimum, the cost of illness will not be discussed. Then for mortality issues, I think that uh, due to the huge work of the OECD team uh, in 2010 and then published in 2012 and used widely by the World Bank, the EHME and the, the WHO, uh, the value of 3 million euros uh, for a death associated to air pollution, long-term ex uh, um, air pollution exposure and then uh, used as a basis and then uh, corrected by the, the gross domestic product of the country, for instance, with respect to uh, USA or OECD countries, for a specific country, is something that, start, uh, that starts being accepted by the community. But there are uh, hidden issues here. This is correct for when you do the analysis for a given country, and you will compare public 
public policies in health, environment, and for some transportation, using within the same countries the same values. So it's going to be nice for that. But when you consider uh, tra international, uh, transnational uh, issues, there are some ethical uh, uh, problems because imagine uh, it's going to be a, a part of, of my, my talk tomorrow. But imagine that you have uh, greenhouse gas that are emitted in a, in a pl given place, but then uh, uh, it goes in the atmosphere. Then they are going to kill people. And if you consider the number of people killed in different countries and you value differently death in these different countries, then you may face issues saying that northern country may afford polluting because they can pay for the death of people from the south because the value of a permitted facility in, the, in less developed countries is lower. So there are some ethical issues that arrive that enter the, the problem very quickly. So what is, uh, what I have presented here what in the framework of health for a given country, for uh, when the analysis uh, exceed uh, the limit of the border of a country, then uh, you, we have to pay attention to what we are doing. Yeah, thank you very much, Olivier. I would like to underline that uh, all these estimations are underestimation. You agree with me very often? I mean, uh, because, uh, for example, when you show at the table uh, 2,000 euro for cardiac, uh, for an infarctus, uh, that's, <laughs> it's very... The cost of illness, uh, one hospitalization uh, of uh, five or six days uh, at this time. And very often uh, things, uh, unfortunately, are not uh, smooth at all. Uh, there are uh, complications. Uh, you, so uh, really here we have to, to deal with, uh, uh, for me, the lower confidence uh, interval, uh, I mean, the, the, the range, uh, lower range of the, the cost. Yes, cost of illness uh, yeah. is uh, the lower bound, yes. Mm -hmm. you agree with me, because it's uh, actually you very well show it that it's very difficult to, to, to take into account all the expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when you are dealing with tangible uh, uh, cost because uh, the individuals are not all equal, and, uh, and also it depends on the country. In USA, it's more expensive than uh, in France, for example, etc. etc. In addition to, to this, for the public decision maker, uh, cost tariffs prices are observed as an, have an impact on the economics, but intangible effects, even if they are larger, uh, count for zero in, in the decision. Uh, uh, maybe I, my question is about the, the list of the disease of the other health risks uh, that you have used for evaluation the costs. For example, uh, now we know that um, the air pollution is one of the principal cause that modifies the innate immunity system for children. Uh, uh, do, you, uh, if, do you have considered the the immunity disease like uh, Crohn, uh, intolerance for, intolerance for, um, for toward uh, lactose, uh, the, the many disease related to the immunity system. That do you uh, take in consideration this disease or not? It, it depends. Here, I do not, uh, I, I, I do not precise exactly the 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 type of uh, disease taken into account but for an economist as soon as from the epidemiologic part our colleagues give us a number of cases of a given of a specific uh, disease then we take this number of cases and we look in the literature or in data from the health system what is the value of this disease we, we are not choosing which are the diseases we have to take into account we trust our epidemiologist colleagues. And if they said Crohn disease, there are 200 cases of Crohn disease in this city due to this, we say, okay, you are sure? Yes, okay, we count for, for this. And we look in the literature how much people are willing to pay to avoid having the Crohn disease or how much it costs to have a Crohn disease per year. 
times the duration of uh, this disease, and we, we value them. So the choice is just on the value, not on the type of illnesses. And for things that are, do not correspond to disease, like uh, the um, uh, physiological parameters that are affected by air pollution, the lower respiratory capacity, here again, if we are told how much this uh, respiratory capacity or fraction of expiratory volume uh, expired, I don't know exactly, uh, is affected, if it is affected by pollution, then we are going to look in the literature how much people are willing to pay to have their uh, FEV level maintained uh, instead of decreased, and then we will uh, count this type of uh, symptoms in the analysis. We do not choose, we just trust our colleagues and we look for the better prices or better value to, to take in them into account. Okay, my question is, uh, is it possible to validate uh, your cal calculation? Because uh, how, how, if it is possible, how do you validate your calculation of the economic cost? Because we don't want to get uh, under estimation or offer estimation of the, the value. Thank you. Regarding the validation, I think there are at least two issues in your question. First, for the cost of illness, it directly comes from the health system. So the validation is just by saying that the average cost of an hospitalization due for myocardial infection, for instance, is X uh, euros, X dollars. Then it is validated by the data from the health system. Then the validation of the willingness to pay, because it's an observed directly on the market, so there are no supply, no demand, it's just what people say the, the only way to do is to compare if it is uh, consistent across countries, across surveys, across the degree of uh, severity of the disease, uh, and if it is consistent with their own income, it's uh, close to the question asked before, but the only way to validate it is just to, to check if it is reasonable and if it is robust in the results across countries, etc. But regarding the validation for the willingness to pay, there are no benchmark uh, for which you, uh, that can be used. For cost of illness, what is considered is that it is a lower bond. Uh, we have said that before, and everybody ag agrees with that. For the willingness to pay, it is the cost the society consider uh, the issue of air pollution uh, is worth for for them. Uh, we have no f clear validation like in other disciplines like epidemiology. Or... Okay. Just one question. Uh, since you have this cost of illness that can vary a lot between uh, countries, how you can compare then the cost of air pollution between countries? I mean, just for, for the diseases, morbidity. I mean, uh, in US, uh, you have uh, you have to pay actually so uh, and it's much more expensive than for example in Europe where you have a universalistic health system where basically also in the willing, willing, willingness to pay you are not taking into account going to the hospital I mean so it's, it's uh, the last part of your question, regarding willingness to pay, I skip the, the slide. The point is we have to ask people what they had in mind when they answer their willingness to pay. Because some of them take into account for asthma, for instance, that the fact that they have to go every five or six years uh, for an emergency room visit or uh, to spend some uh, a few days at hospital uh, due to the asthma uh, disease. And so when they give us the willingness to pay, they partly consider the discomfort, the pain, the suffering, and so on, but also the fact that they spend some time at hospital. So this is because there may be a double counting uh, between COI and, and willingness to pay. But we can avoid that by, by being very precise, asking them, you say 100 euros, did you think about this, 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 yes, no, and we remove the, the double counted part. And regarding the, the comparison across countries, what can, can be done for morbidity is to compare the share associated to air pollution exposure with the gross domestic product, because it's a way to account for uh, the, the share of the issue in the whole system. But we can also be more precise in uh, 
counting who is going to pay. If it is uh, the health system, if it is uh, uh, the insurance, uh, health insurance, uh, private health insurance, if it is the employer, uh, employee, employer, if you, you have a work uh, loss of production, uh, part of this loss of production is paid by your insurance, health insurance, part by the employer, so you can be more precise than that by uh, trying to see who is going to pay for this uh, health burden. Thank you. I had a question uh, related to the, to the validation. And rather than validation, I was wondering if we could talk about verification or a posteriori uh, assessment of the, of the, of the uh, recommendation that could be made. Let me explain. When, when you assess the economic cost for society, if you come up with a cost that is low enough so that you would recommend and, and conclude that society can, can bear this cost, can you come back 10 or 20 years later I would say, look, it was possible to do it, and the economic growth and so on made it possible for measures to be paid by the society and air pollution to be mitigated. So is it a, a type of approach that can be implemented the, the, to verify that your, your diagnostic at a given time was realized 20 years after? The, the issue is that uh, compared to other large uh, public health uh, problems, the deaths here are not specific. So in uh, transportation, if you have a, a very strong policy against road accidents, you will count the number of accidents avoided. If you have a vaccination campaign, you can see 10 years later how much less people have developed a given illness. In this case, because the, the health uh, consequences are common to several causes, it's very difficult to assess what is the direct impact of a policy. You can do it statistically. On average, you compute uh, uh, whether or not accounting for the evolution of the population in age, in uh, le uh, average level of health, there have been an improvement uh, associated to a decrease in air pollution exposure. But it's very, very less clear. You can do this pro uh, correctly and accurately with air pollution than for most of the other health policies that uh, government can uh, choose to, to implement. Uh, it's it's uh, a pity both for, for the environmentalists or health people working in health, public health because it's not easy to come back to the public decision maker saying it was a good policy because you, these are the people that, uh, for which the death have been avoided. Uh, for road accidents, it's easy. You compare the trend and you, you try to match with the different policies implemented, the speed limitation, the seat belt, and, and you see how much people, uh, how much less people have been uh, injured, uh, have been killed. But it's a real uh, issue with, with air pollution. It's less easy. Uh, and the, the government and the public decision maker has to trust you when you say, on average, given the trend in the population, we may have been observed this trend and we finally observed this one. But uh, it's, it's true that it's difficult. Yes. Thank you very much, Olivier. I, I suggest that we continue the discussions and questions at the coffee break. Otherwise, they are going to remove it. Uh, may I ask a final question? How many uh, from the participants are familiar with those uh, economic cost calculations? One, <laughs> one lecturer. Okay, so we, we had many new concepts today, uh, Olivier. So maybe I suggest that tomorrow you might uh, provide a, a list of the, all those new acronyms and, and concepts that, we, uh, that are new for most of us. Okay, so there's a coffee break over there. Uh, maybe we can take time also, additional time to posters for some of you uh, uh, who, who want to present again their results. Thank you very much and uh, see you tomorrow at 8.45.